And so, five, in the places about Jerusalem, round about Jerusalem, they bought, bought enormous quantities of fields. In the cities of the mountains. You see, the mountains in Israel, they are going here from north to south, or from south to north, yeah? This is the, 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 the desert of Negev. So the, the biblical land was from Beersheba up to Dan in the north. From here up to the north, Dan. So the mountains of Israel are here. And we know, especially in between Jerusalem and Hebron, they bought much land. Seven, in the cities of the Shephelah. The Hebrew term Shephelah means the lowland. But you, you cannot apply Shephelah in Hebrew to, to the Netherlands. It is just this plain here in the west of the mountains of Judea up to the Mediterranean Sea. And there they bought most land in Judah. Eight, in the cities of the Negev. Yes, just south of Beersheba, in the desert of the Negev, they bought much land. So every point has been literally fulfilled. Nine, restoration of Old Testament cities. The last two verses of Amos 9.14. God is speaking, I will bring about the, the restoration of my people Israel. You see, again, this term, this typical term, restoration of. The restoration of my people Israel. They shall rebuild and inhabit their ruined cities, plant vineyards and drink the wine, set out orchards, orchards and eat the fruits. I will plant them upon their own ground. Never again shall they be plucked from the land I have given them, say I, the Lord your God. Now, we are eyewitnesses. How ancient cities of the Old Testament are today modern cities full of life, of modern life. Well, somebody could say, well, but there is an error of exegesis. This is a prophecy about the Jews coming back from the Babylonian captivity in the sixth century before Christ, when the Persians took Babylon over. Oh, really? Well, I have a problem. Because you read here, I will plant them upon their own ground. Never again shall they be plucked from the land I have given them. But the, the greatest disaster of being scattered was from 70 AD. So this is the final return. You cannot ap apply this verse to the return from the captivity in Babylon. So there are other passages in the Old Testament I could show you that they are speaking about the return from Babylon. Of course, this was also foretold. But this is the final return in the end times. 10, vineyards and vine. Well, the text says, they shall rebuild and inhabit their ruined cities, plant vineyards and drink the wine. So, Superficially reading the Bible, one could say, well, they will plant some vineyards and drink wine. What, what, what is special in this prophecy? But I have to say, when God is saying something, he never uses too much words, like it may be the case with us sometimes. It has always a deep meaning. Now let's look at the fulfillment. In just after the death of Muhammad in 632, the Muslims from the Arabic Peninsula went north in order to make the conquest of the land of Israel, Palestine. And they, they conquered Jerusalem in 638. 
And then this country became a Muslim country. And what about all the vineyards that had so much importance for Israeli agriculture in the Old Testament? You see all the passages about vineyards in the Old and also in the New Testament, for example, in the, in the parables of the Lord Jesus. This was out. And when the Jews came back from Russia at the end of the 19th century, they had really a problem with agriculture. And you see, many of them were, were uh, academics. And they had to become specialists of agriculture. That's, that's a difficult point, but it, it worked. They asked, well, what, what about this country? And that time, Baron de Rothschild from Bordeaux, the specialist of, of Bordeaux vines, said, well, you should bring along vineyards from France. And they did it. They brought the vineyards to, to, to Israel later on from California. And now, vineyards and wine are a very important part of modern Israeli agriculture. And they got many gold medals of wine of highest quality in the world. Of course, the best in the, in the Middle East, but that, that's not very difficult to do. But <laughs> on the world level, and now that's, that's the fulfillment, plant vineyards and drink the wine. 11, orchards and fruits. Well, they will plant some, some fruits, yes? Some trees of fruit. Well, it is more. They asked, what about other things than vineyards? Well, exotic fruits from Asia, oranges, mandarins, and so on, and mango would, would grow well on this soil. And now Israel built up an agriculture that is really specialized on, on citrus fruits and, and other exotic fruits. And they are even uh, exporting uh, a great part of it into the whole world. And if you have ever eaten Jaffa oranges, you had really the taste of fulfilled prophecies on your tongue. Well, also, th th there is a deep meaning, set out orchards and eat the fruits. And then, in between, let's go to Isaiah 17, 10. And in verse and there you read, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and has not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shalt set it with strange slips. Why strange slips? Now we know it. Because all the vineyards in the Middle East at that time were of no great value. They had to bring the Bordeaux vine from, from France and afterwards the even so good from California and also from Germany. Very interesting. And the context is also interesting because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. You have to know most of the Zionists at the end of the 19th century that came back from Russia, they were socialists, agnostics, atheists, and they came back just in order to find a solution of the Jewish question. They came not back in order to fulfill prophecy of the Bible. Yes, and they asked, what, what can we do? Well, said Baron de Rothschild, bring the vineyards along. Well, therefore shall thou plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. You see this? Exactitude of the word of God. 13, the desert shall, shall blossom. Let's go again, back to Ezekiel 36. We read already in point one, verse 24. And now, a little later. And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Yes, they planted since their first coming up to now about 
240 million trees. And this changed even the, the climate, of course. This has a, a, a reaction on, on, on the climate, on, on rain, yeah? And today Israel is even exporting flowers into the world. And I'm so happy when I bring groups to, to Israel to, to show the, the land. I like especially those who are coming the first time. And they are amazed in spring and also in fall, seeing all these wonderful flowers. And really, they can say, this land is become like the Garden of Eden. 14. Founding the Statehood of Israel, May 14, 1948. Now you see, the first decades, decades of the return of the Jews was characterized still by absence of Jewish statehood. But as a consequence of the destruction of six million Jews in Europe, most of the civilized nations in the UN voted 1947 for the founding of Jewish statehood. And then came this day. Although the, the Arab people, the Arab countries said, we will destroy immediately Israel if this will take place. Isaiah 66, 8. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons in birth pangs. It was really the, the time when the, the terrorism of the Palestinians attained a peak before May 14, and then since May 15, the total war broke out against Israel. And in these birth pangs, one day, the Jewish statehood was established. 15, this is this point, not just on one day, against statehood of the Jews, which was not possible during nearly 2,000 years, suddenly possible because of the destruction of 6 million Jews. Today, world politics would no more accept such a decision. But it was really under the impression of the destruction of, of the Jews in the Holocaust. And so it took place as soon as Zion traveled in the time of war. 16, the conquest of Mount Zion, June 7, 1967. Well, the United Nations, they decided that the Jews should have a statehood in Palestine, but not Eastern Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, Zion or Moriah. Now, students of Bible prophecy, they could ask themselves, well, what about the prophecies of the Bible that the Jews will come back to Zion, the Mount, the Temple Mount? But Eastern Jerusalem was divided by, the, by Jordan through a wall. No access to the Temple Mount for Jews. And then came the days of June, 1967, when the Arab nations around Israel told that they, they, the destruction of Israel is now immediate. The Six-Day War broke out. And in this war, Israel took over the Temple Mount and Eastern Jerusalem as a response to the second trial in order to destroy the Jews in Israel. And then it was fulfilled Psalm 126 in written in prophetical past, which is a, a technical term in Hebrew grammar. The future foretold in a language like it was already realized. Song of degrees, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, this is a Temple Mount, 
We are like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. Yes, all people said this at that time. After six days against many Arab nations, they succeeded completely in this war. After six days, all was over. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. 17. The aim of the enemies, the complete destruction of Israel. Now let's read in a prophetical psalm, Psalm 83, a prayer in the end times. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For Lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. This has never been fulfilled in the past of history, but three times in our time, 1948-49, the total war of all the nations around Israel against Israel. Then in 1967, where again many nations came again against Israel. And in 1973, in the Yom Kippur War. And three times their aim was the total destruction, not just the conquest of the land, the total destruction of the Jews. Then you could ask, well, but I would like to know in this psalm, who is speaking like that? Verse 4, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. Who is speaking? Well, let's go on. Verse 5, for they have consulted together with their one consent. They are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarenes. Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the, with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assur also is joined with them. They have holpen the children of Lot, Selah. Which means now that the choir is silent and the orchestra is playing and people are thinking about what they heard. So Selah is very important. Um, you see here, who are the enemies? A confederation. They are confederate against thee. And you have to know, in 1945, nations around future Israel, they built up the Arab League. And League means a confederation. It's the Latin word. Liga. A confederation, and the, the aim of the Arab League was to prevent Jewish statehood. And when Jewish statehood was a fact, the aim of the, of the League in the following years was the destruction of Jewish statehood. Interesting. But we have more details. The text says the tabernacles of Edom. Well, you don't find the, the modern terms in the Bible. But take a, a biblical lexicon, consult the term Edom, and you will see Edom was a people in the south of today's Jordan. Moab in the middle, at the other side of the Dead Sea of Jordan, and Ammon in the north. The capital, Amman, takes the name from this people, Ammon. Of course, Moab and Ammon were children of Lot, and these were their, descendant, uh, their descendants. Now, these three terms hint to the territory of today's Jordan. And Jordan was one of the founding nations of the Arab League.
Now we just uh, saw the hint to Jordan as a member of the alliance of Israel's enemies. Let's go on by the term Ishmaelites in verse 6. Now, the Ishmaelites were tribes that descended from Ishmael, son of Abraham. And they lived 2,000 years ago in the territory of today's Saudi Arabia. So this is a hint to the Arabic Peninsula and really, Saudi Arabia and Yemen were also foundation members of the Arab League. 21, Syria. In verse 6, you have the term Hagarines. Now, take again a biblical lexicon, a Bible lexicon, and you will find the term Hagarines representing the, a, a tribe that lived in the south of today's Syria and also in, uh, up in the north of Jordan. So here we have a poetical hint to the territory of today's Syria, which was also one of the foundation members. 22, Lebanon. In verse 7, you find two cities mentioned, Gebal, in Arabic, Gebal, it's the same as Biblos in the ancient history. Gebal in the more in the north of Lebanon and the city of Tyre in the south of Lebanon. Now, this is a clear hint to Lebanon, which was also a foundation member of the Arab League. 23, Egypt, you see the term Amalek which was a people that lived in biblical times already in the, in the Sinai Peninsula. You know, when the children of Israel went out of Egypt in the book of Exodus, the first enemies they met in the desert were, was Amalek, Exodus 17. Now, this is a hint to the territory which is today Egypt. And Egypt was also a foundation member. And then we find the term, the land of the Philistines, which in the Bible was the territory of today's Gaza Strip and around the Strip. And of course, all these foundation members that I mentioned, they established this alliance in view of the Arab Palestinians. And it's interesting, with all these names, you have a hint to all the foundation members of the Arab League. All the other members, today more than 20, came joined to the, to the, the alliance afterwards. Well, I forgot one. Point 25, Iraq. Because in verse 8, you have the term Assur also is joined with them. And Assur was a nation in antiquity placed in the north of today's Iraq, where you find the city of, of Nineveh and so on. And Assur, also a city of antiquity. So Iraq was also, together with all the others, a foundation member. Now we have every point. Now let's go to point 26 and 27 and take them together. Flight and exodus of the Jews out of Iraq. I have to explain the background. You know that the, the Jews came back from the Babylonian captivity in 539 before Christ. But many Jews remained in that territory up to the 20th century. So in, in, a, in, a, certain, in a certain way, the Babylonian capti captivity continued. And so in the 20th century, there, there was still a community of around 150,000 Jews 
in Iraq. And I have to explain that the term Babylonia is a term that hints to this, this former empire in this place in the south of today's Iraq. So there were 150,000 Jews in Babylonia up to our time. But in 1941, this was in a time of the destruction of the Jews by the Nazis in Europe. But there was an, a, a connection between Nazi Germany and Iraq at that time. And therefore, they commit in Baghdad a, a terrible, slaughter, terrible slaughter against the Jews. And this led to the foundation of uh, an underground society that should help the Jews to go out of modern Iraq. And so thousands of Jews went out of Iraq and went to Palestine, because at the time there was no statehood. And all changed in 1950. The leader of Iraq at that time thought we should make an end to this flight of the Jews. And he said, well, I give the permission to the Jews, they can go out. So some thousands of Jews will go and then we stop everything. And now more than 100,000 Jews announced they're going out of Iraq and they had to, to annul their Iraqi citizenship. And they could only sell their goods for 10th 